are you going? Good, good. Yourself? Yeah, I'm very good, mate. Um, child free today, always on a Thursday. Um, my daughter goes to daycare, so it's a lot quieter around the house. What about yourself? What have you been up to? Mate, um, yeah, well, today, Thursday, is a, it's a good one for me. I'm only working in the mornings, and then I have the rest of the day off, and then have to kick back on in the afternoon to coach the squad. So, yeah. start of the week's a little bit busy for me, but coming towards the end, it eases up. So, yeah, today's a good day. Mate, growing up in, in Western Sydney, um, Blacktown for you, what was it like being a Westie? I know I grew up in, in Campbelltown, we're referred to as Westies. What was it like out that way for you? Yeah, like it was, oh, mate, I loved it. It's a lot of stories that can come from it. And, you know, over this break as well, like we've had the lockdown and being re going back, I've gone back to my old stomping ground where I grew up in Blacktown and it brought a lot of memories back of you know, running around and Friday night club nights out there with all the kids from the area just playing cricket and then mum running out saying you're meant to be competing, get on the block. And so like growing up in the West, it wasn't sitting at home watching TV. We were always out playing footy or soccer and running around enjoying the neighbourhoods or riding my bikes in the bush and doing some BMX riding. It, you know, it, it was a good little, good little life out there. I enjoyed it a lot. It's funny with club nights, it, it sort of changes, doesn't it? When you're younger, it's always you're missing the, the race because of handball or something yeah. like that yeah. or footy with the boys. As you get older, it's because you're chasing the girls and you, yeah. you're supposed to be over there, but you're in a group somewhere where no one can see you. Anyway, I don't yeah. race. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't get myself into trouble. Now, yeah. let's get stuck into your swimming. What, what sort of a younger swimmer were you? Were you at the front of the line, at the back of the line? Were you loud? Were you quiet, mate? Where did you fit into that sort of junior level at, in squads? Um, well, when I was growing up, I had two sisters that, you know, I followed through my swimming career. Um, but I basically followed them and were quite quiet. Achievers coming through and getting through and knocking it off. But when I got a little bit older and moved up into the state group, I always envied the older guys and always wanted to be up the top and lead or try and nickel at their ankles or try and beat them. And I was sort of that, oh, how do you put it, a little bit cocky, but knowing in myself and with me was basically it's like if I can beat these guys I'm only getting myself better and you know you have the odd odd argument with some of the older boys that you know you're kicking when you're doing pull and you know like the little blow ups you have and growing up in a western side like city and going from two and Gabby I still remember having one of the older boys you know didn't like it but you know I was given a bit of an ass kick and then training and you know, the best thing he did to me is grab my goggles and he flicked them off and smacked me in the face and slit my eyebrow open and you know, as my old man said suck it up and yeah. keep doing what you're doing because you're getting under the skin and you're only getting better from it so oh, look I was a bit of a heckler I, I like to get in there and a bit of banter I like to push the boys and I like to push the younger guys because how I see it is like if they're not pushing me I'm not getting any better and you know one day I'll step away and you know, they're going to be the next generation coming through and so these guys helped me out a fair bit but through that swimming career, it was like, I was a heckler. I liked to do it just to improve myself, basically. Hey, we'll, we'll get to the Olympics in Beijing in a second, but talk to me about making your first Olympic team. You know, someone like me will, you know, never understand that. And it's all that hard work and the effort, chasing that dream. You realise that? That must have been sort of a, a surreal moment for you. Yeah, it's a, um, and that was a goal with Tony and I and to get on the team. Um, and we sort of had a bit of a bet if I make the team and Grant Bricks, another gentleman I used to swim with as well, um, make the team and go certain times that Tony had the shady moustache because he's always had the, yeah, the white yeah. fox has always had the moustache and he's never taken it off. And <laughs> we had to go certain times and we didn't achieve the times that we both made um, the team. And it was awesome to be part of, like, not make my first Olympics, but also be on that team with a guy who was from the same club as me. And we know all the hard work we put into it. So it was it was surreal. It was unbelievable to make that and I was quite young still to be getting on that team and to make it as an individual spot as well, even it blew my mind more with Nicholas Springer as the, um, the other 200 similar too. Now, the experience, the Beijing experience, talk us through it. You know, the, the firstly, you know, the atmosphere over there and all that sort of stuff, but then obviously into the pool with your um, results. Yeah, um, well, I look at to, I look at Beijing as not a. I also look a bit of it as a bit of a you know I regret what happened um, leading up to Beijing. I look back now, I probably wasn't in the best shape of my form because I made the team. I'm like, oh, 
I've probably decided I've, I've done everything I had to do, um, especially being my first, not knowing what to do, how to, what I have to do, how to prep for this or get through it. And, um, and then basically getting there was a whole nother ball game. You know, you get thrown into a village, you go and get your uniforms, your big warehouses and your run team and you just move as one big unit as a team. And, um, then you go to the pool the first time and it's just, it's very overwhelming and it's a bit of a slap in the face when you see all these other countries come in and, and I still remember the Beijing like you're walking in and we went to the dining hall and your dining hall is like three football fields long of all these different foods from around the world and but then you see these American team walk in the US basketball team and then you see the swimming team walk in and I still remember watching Michael Phelps walk in and was like oh here he is and he walked straight to Macca's and <laughs> has his cheeseburger in front of everyone. You're like, oh, well, he's just, and you don't know what's going on. And you just get caught up in this little bit of a bubble. And I think from that, basically, then it sort of, I, I say, it shot myself in the foot. I just started putting a lot of weight on my shoulders to, all right, I've got to swim unbelievable here, improve myself, um, coming off of 2007, finishing fourth in a 200 freestyle world championships. I was like, well, I've got to prove myself again. And, I really did hurt myself going into that heat and I didn't even get through the semi-final. I was disgusted. I went 148. It wasn't a great swim at all. Um, then thinking in the back of my mind, like, all right, cool. I've still got the four by two to go. Let's reassess. Let's get back in there. Let's start getting everything moving again. And yeah. it was really good because I started to really, you know, push that to go from there. And then at that time, um, I still remember I got the phone call, got the phone from, from Tomo um, and was told that I'll be stood down. I won't be swimming in the final for the 4 by 2 Um As normal, usually protocol goes as you, your fastest swimmers go through. And yeah, so that was a sort of a massive kick in the gut. Um, that hurt me a fair bit. And, you know, Nicholas didn't get the swim either um, in that final and where these guys walked away with a bronze medal. Um, so it was a bit of a kick in the guts and it hurt me, but it also made me realize as an individual, I've got to be better. Um, I can't allow all that pressure on myself. I've got to be a little bit more professional about this. Hey, you bring up again, something very interesting that I think, um, we're trying to get better at here in Australia with the swimmers, uh, is that, you know, transferring the great results we always have in trials through to the Olympics and, and it could be world champs or wherever it may be, but for this, we'll, we'll go with the Olympics and, and, you know, transferring those over and trying to improve on them because always we seem to kill it at trials and everyone's yeah. cock a hurt and they're, you know, they're, you know, yeah. flexing and everything. And then all of a sudden we get to the Olympics and obviously as you know, and everyone that I've, I've spoken to on, on here on the podcast, know it's just a completely, different ball game it's not a world champs it's not a com games it is a completely different beast and and sometimes you can get sort of caught up in that how hard do you think is it to to transition that and now that you went through that if if you you know we're going to talk to someone on the olympic team now who's just going to go to their first olympics hopefully next year if it all goes ahead what advice would you give to them yeah i i look at it now is to understand that everyone's in the same situation you are going forward, even if it's their third, their fourth, their fifth, it's still a special moment for everyone, but it's going out and asking and talking to people. Um, what we do quite well, we've had a lot of some very good support staff on the team as they're willing to help, but also there's some really good older athletes on that team where they're willing to help because they've gone through those experiences as well. And yes, it's their fourth time or their third, the games or the second, but they can talk you through the process and, and help you out and sort of mentor you through it because it is scary. Uh, it's, there's no lie to it. And it's basically some of these young kids that go on and make their first team, I would be basically saying is don't be a closed book, be an open book um, and take as much as you can in, but also go and talk to people um, that are on your team that have lived it or, you know, they might be going through it and be you know supportive to each other. Don't just, be a turtle and hide. Um, it's be open. That's the best thing. Mate, 2008, after Beijing, you make a move up to Queensland and train with uh, someone I regard as a super coach, Michael Bowl. What brought that about? Um, at that time, after Beijing, our squad sort of 
folded away. A lot of retired, um, a lot of people, yeah, basically a lot of them retired or they were very young swimmers. And I spoke, sat down with my coach at the time, Tony Shaw, and just asked, I said, look, I'm getting to a stage where I may need a bit of a freshen up if I want to keep going in this game. Um, and he suggested to me, you know, have a look into moving to Queensland or moving down to AIS. And I sort of tossed that up. It's like sunshine to Canberra. <laughs> or I don't know. Um, and I made a phone call and Tony suggested to talk to Michael Bowl. And at that time, Michael was coaching Nicholas Springer, who I was on the team with. And Bowley had been my coach at Beijing as well because yep. Tony wasn't selected. So he was sort of looking after me too. So he, um, he said, look, Nicholas is stepping away. He's retiring from the games, uh, from the sport. Would you, there's an opening. More than welcome to come up here and train, see how you go. And yeah, basically I, two weeks later, I packed up, moved out of home and had to fend for myself. So yeah. Do you enjoy living up, uh, up on, uh, in the sunny state? Yeah, I loved it. It was good. I made some amazing friendships up there, but also I had a lot of friends up there too. And, you know, Brisbane, I'll, listen, they're probably about 10 years behind coming from Sydney. You know, it's hustle and bustle down here. Um, we're up there. I, I still remember my first session. I rocked up and I reckon I was half an hour early and I'm sitting in the car and I'm like, where is everyone? Like, Don't they get here on time? Like people start rocking up at quarter two and Bowley pulls in. He's like, hey, mate. And I'm like, Bolly, and he's like, "You're early." I'm like, yeah, "Radio," and from there, I was always that athlete. I was always before Bolly even got to got to the pool. I was always there. I'd be, you know, off running stairs or doing the little extra things before even Bolly got to the pool. And then when I finished up, he would be there, and I walked in. And uh, I think that was our little bit of um, the connection with Bolly and I. He'd like to see me always do the little extra things, and yeah. that's one thing I take away from Sydney. It taught me and. You know, we implemented a fair bit of that up there at Queensland too. Talk to me about the coaches you've had during your career. You know, how influential were they and, and how different were they? You know, you're a coach now yourself. How different were they with, you know, their philosophies and, and their approach? Um, a lot of my time when I was a junior swim in, um, Tony Shaw was my coach uh, all the way up to basically 18. Uh, and he was lucky enough and I was lucky enough at that time that we were also blended we had a blended squad with um, Tomo um, I think they were called Campbelltown and uh, it was some talk about trying to make a TNT squad Tony and Tomo but uh, we all sum out at one stage out of Homebush um, and you know I think having Tomo as a coach you would know you know that and Tony they're pretty like they were straight down the line um, this is what we're doing a little bit old school onto it but Coming towards the end of Tony, it was the you know we started to step more into the biomechanics side um, and being a bit you know, smarter of what we had to do. Where and you know, that ended, and the rest of my career moved on to being with Bowley. And um, you know, I look at Bowley. Bowley was a he knew how to manage people. Um, he knew what was right for his athletes. He knew everything about his athletes, and he basically more mentored me and guided me in the right direction of where we had to go and what we had to do. Mm. Um, and so if I needed to be more explosive of a block, it would be like, all right, we're going to use the experts to get this done. It's not like now both of these coaches would never stand there and say, I know the game. Um, they would always, you know, ask for advice, give their opinion and work with the athletes. So yeah. I would have to say both of my coaches are very similar. Um, but they always put the athlete first, um, I would have to say. it. So I've never been with a coach where, you know, I only swim three 3,000 metres a session. Um, and I think our minimum's always ran around that five up to the 7K. So like I've, I've never had a very a sprint-specific coach. Um, they were always very middle distance coaching. So they're very similar, but they both, oh, look, I can't even say that different at all they're both basically i look at it now they're, they're very similar <laughs> but they always put the athlete first and like the bond i had with tony like i always cherish and i still talk to him he's a great mentor and same with bowley like i both looked at those two guys as father figures um i think bowley comes more of a father figure because i moved away from home and he was my beck and call uh, if I, anything went wrong and he would always be there and always stick his neck out for me and help me as much as he could 
In terms of race plans, you know, say for a 200, what was your race plan when you were behind the blocks? Was it fairly detailed? Was it fairly broad? It never changed. Never changed one yeah. bit. It was very simple. Um, and it was basically from Tomo. Um, okay. Alan Thompson told me, 450s, mate. That's all it is. Uh, never changed. I've always had that race plan. It was always about making sure the three R's, the range of rhythm relaxation, and that even carried on over to Bowley as well. Um, I don't know what coach came up with that. I know people talk about it. People try and take credit for it. But, you know, these guys have been in the game for a very long time and I've heard it for a very long time. I even, I steal it too. Um, I was about and, to say, I said range, rhythm and relaxation this yeah. morning while I was coaching. That's it. I don't know if Bill Swindon came up with it. Yeah. But um, like my race strategy, it was, it was very simple, 450s cut it down, eliminate one, you know, get through the first one, get through the second one, you know, start to build the third 50 and come home like a steam train, don't leave anything left in the tank. Um, pretty basic, don't complicate it. No, I like it, mate. Talk to me about 2012, uh, London. You know, firstly, this is your, your second experience there. Um, do you look back on that and say, you know, okay, I was more confident because it was my second or is it Olympics... Still an Olympic, so it doesn't matter how many times you've been there, it's still the big show. Um, I, it's, I get, you just said it. It's still the big show. It's the pinnacle of our sport. But it's, um, I was probably a lot more relaxed going into this. I knew what was coming. Um, and leading into it, it was a bit of a roller coaster. But it was also, you know, it, it probably made me a little bit more resilient going into that games and going, well, you know, this could be my last. Um, who knows? what's going to happen from this, but let's get in there and have a crack at it. And you know, I walked away, I made a semi-final, I did a PB um, in the heat, got through there and just missed out on the final. But, you know, and then I was lucky enough to be in the final for the four by two that I missed out on four years ago. So yeah. sort of tick boxes for me, um, that 2012 and the experience to be there with 10 other of my training partners on the bowling. I think at that time we had 11 guys on the Olympic team that Bowley was coaching. So it was unbelievable experience to know that you were going into this race and then also going into that relay, having your teammates right next to you. Mate, how much, you mentioned the relays, how much do you enjoy relays with the boys? And, and you'd been through, you know, many throughout your career. And the other question to that is, is there more or less pressure? Because I've heard conflicting, you know, stories. Some people come out and they're like, oh, it's a lot more relaxed because you, you know, you're with your mates and, you know, you feel a lot more sort of chilled, but then the other side of it is you don't want to let your mates down. So some of them yeah. feel there's a bit more pressure. What about for you? Um, for me, I never really saw the pressure side to it. I always enjoyed it being with you know your teammates and three other guys. I always had fun with it. It sort of brought me back to like school swimming and just getting in there and showing off how good you are. Um, I'm part of this group. I'm going to show this group how good I am and everyone else standing next to me. And... You know, I think some of my best races came from relay, um, and I, I just I thrived on them. I love them. I love being part of it. Uh, you can put me in any position. I'm going to have a crack. It's and then sometimes you know I could stand there and I could see one of the best Olympic swimmers next standing next to me. I'm like, mate, I'm going to show you off. I'm going to have a crack at you. And you just go that next level because when you get out of the pool, you have your teammates there straight away, mate. A, a relay was. You know, I love them. I couldn't. I can't get enough of them. I still love them. I still love watching them, um, and I love watching my kids being part of them because it's you know, they're putting everything on the line for their teammates. Mate, incidents throughout your career, and then there were a, a few that got picked up by the media. Now, were these just media blow-ups and sort of out of proportion, or do you think these were lessons learnt for yourself? Um, I think I, one of them is probably my own stupidity, um, and that was a skateboarding accident, and you know that I think got blown really out of proportion um, I still remember someone saying to me you know you're on the front cover of every newspaper there is in Australia mm. um, and the second page on there is you know we've got people dying in the world so yeah. I'm like yeah this is ridiculous but you know from that I, it's no one to blame except myself and I looked at that I was like well you know I've got to be honest with myself mm. and it taught me a lesson to own what I do. Um, and then, you know, going off of there, going over to America and you know, having some guns in my hand, I think every person's done it. Um, I've been on Australian swimming teams that we've gone to gun ranges and, yeah. you know, that's Australian media. They love to blow up things and make it a little bit ridiculous. And, you know, it's, 
it's hard, but that's just that's Australian media. You got to love them sometimes. Yeah. But um, I, I look at it now as like, well, okay, cool. We could have been smarter. Probably not to post something or do it. But even when I was posting, then Instagram wasn't even as, really as big as it was what it is now. Um, so it'd be a lot harder for kids um, growing through the you know the world or the sporting world and being smart on it. But it's a, you know, I learn a lot from that, and I try and help people when I see things. Just go, mate, look, this could bite you in the ass. It happens, but make sure if you do post that, you've got to own it and accept it. I and mean, trust me, I've lived it, um, and it hurts. But you know, let's just let's think before we do things. Sometimes. Yeah. Mate, you mentioned it there with the media and here in Australia. And every time I think of uh, Australian media, I think of Chopper. And what he used to say was, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So uh, I definitely think there's always, a, a, you know, a little bit of truth to these things that come out, no oh. doubt, right? But yeah. certainly to be front page, I mean, yeah, as you oh, well. said, there was things going on <laughs> on page two that you're like, that's... I'm, yeah, it's a little bit more important. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I look at it now and go, oh, well, hey, I was on the front page of the Daily Telegraph the straight <laughs> age. Like, fantastic, guys. Thanks so much. Like, free promotion, awesome. Like, it's a, you know, and I think our lease manager said it once, you know, any publicity is good publicity. So, but I don't look at it as trying to push myself forward to get out into the world in that note. Um, I'm not like that at all. And, yeah. you know, the Australian... People call me the bad boy of Australian swimming. I'm oh, far from it. Yeah. And that's where the people who know me know that. And a lot of people still judge me for what articles they read online. And they, where I, I just said, you know, you don't read everything and it's not uh, truthful. Mm. It's, uh, I, I sit here today and I hold my head up proud of who I am. And I'm the first person if someone needs help to put their hand up to help them and say, you know, I don't go out of my way to try and show that I do that. I'm just happy to do it. And, you know, like one thing leads to another thing. But, you know, people are starting to understand, you know, the paper, what you read, is not always the truth. Absolutely not. Now, just in keeping with that theme, mate, you know, a lot of um, social media is so much bigger these days. And a lot of athletes do cop a fair bit of flack whether, you know, if they perform well or they don't perform well, or maybe their own reactions to, to their results aren't what people want them to be, which I find ridiculous because who are you to have an opinion on someone else's reaction to something yeah. that they've done? But anyway, let's not get into that because I'll, I'll go on a rant. <laughs> yeah, what, what advice would you give those, those guys? Like, would you say to switch off social media? Obviously, you know, sometimes if, if you don't know what's going on, well, then it's not going to hurt you. Yeah, I don't think we should hide from social media. Um, it's so powerful and it's such a powerful tool now. It's just, I think, educating ourselves on how we can use social media for better gains and for helping other people out there. Um, I do see some things on there and I look at it and go, great, what have I learned? Nothing. I think I've become dumber from watching this video. Um, <laughs> but I feel it's like we shouldn't hide from it. I just think the support around social media is just educating people on how powerful this tool can be. Um, and let's try and make sure it's done in a positive way. Absolutely. Um, just you saying that and feeling dumber after listening to things reminds me of me sitting next to my wife when she's listening to <laughs> watching TikToks and things in bed. Man, I think you might get in trouble tonight. <laughs> oh, no, I tell her anyway. I don't care. I just say, listen, what are you watching? I just feel so stupid even hearing that. Can you turn it down? Put your yeah. in. I don't want to hear it anymore. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <sighs> Mate, now, listen, you're, uh, you, you're transitioned in, into coaching, but for a lot of people, you know, um, transitioning from an elite athlete into everyday life or a new role isn't always easy. When did you make that decision to sort of hang the togs up? And, and did you have an idea of where you were heading once you, you know, sort of made that decision? Because I know maybe not so much in swimming, but, uh, you know, you look at rugby league players and, and they have no idea what they are once they finish. If they can't yeah. go into TV, they yeah. don't know where to go after that. That's it. No, I, um, after 2012, I stepped away from swimming. Didn't want a bar of it. And I'll, one of my mates offered to me a job to help him run a boxing gym in Fortitude Valley mm -hmm. um, and so I went there and became a manager um, and basically ran a professional boxing gym for a couple of years and at that time coming up after a couple of years I 
got a phone call uh, from Nicole Livingston yeah. and asked, would you be interested in coming down to Melbourne and stepping in for six weeks to do a bit of a coaching stint where down a coach? I was like, never lived in Melbourne. All right, whatever. I was like, cool, this could be a good experience. So stepped away from the gym and went down to Melbourne. And at that time, it was winter. And I said to myself, what am I doing? Um, leaving Queensland to come to this. And, but it actually, I fell in love uh, from the other side of it to educating and teaching young kids the art of swimming and the discipline and understanding you know, that it comes with sacrifices on what you've got to do. And I don't want them to, they have to be like me, but I want to guide you to be the best athlete you can be. And I just fell in love with it. And six, six weeks turned into nearly, oh God, was I nearly about three months, four months. And I was lucky enough then I got a job um, off uh, up at Jamboree Heights back up in Queensland. And didn't know what to expect. Had no idea. I think Rob Danderzant was the old coach there. And I heard of the club, but I didn't know what I was walking into. I had no idea the caliber of swimmers. A lot of them have moved on, went with Rob and did everything. I was like, whatever, cool. We can start from scratch. Doesn't bother me. I don't care. This is a stepping stone. Uh, it's my club. Let's just see what we can do. And I walked in and I went, there's four lanes. Wow, what's going on here? I've just come from MSAC where I've got <laughs> two 10 lane 50 meter pools to a four lane 25 that yeah. are meters deep. I'm going, this is going to be very interesting. And when we did Friday night club rights, we made it six lanes and they got skinnier. Um, but it wasn't about the pool, it was about the people around it and how we can make every single person here feel special and enjoy being part of this community and teaching these kids again the art of swimming and i think they got a bit of a shock from me because it was probably a little bit of a hard art to start with but um and it's probably a bit straight down the line but we turned i walked away from that job um putting a couple of kids into a national team uh, into making their first ever nationals and giving opportunities from multi class to able bodies giving everyone the opportunity to be part of something special there and you know, I think it's still thriving, it's growing, it's getting bigger out there too. Uh, Gregor Tate took over from me and I think it's just doubled in numbers, like he's doing an amazing job there. But when that finished up, uh, my partner at that time, or my partner, she got accepted into medicine back down in Melbourne and that week I was queen, basically. Um, I got another phone call from Vic Center again, uh, from the Cole Livingston asking, would I like to come back? and coach our national group and i was like cool um yeah right love to why not yeah. came down and you know i stepped into a different arena um knew a lot of bodies knew a lot of people there and and then my career basically started blossoming from there man i've got to tell you um and i'll give you the props on air as well as off air but the work you did at jamboree heights was something for me that I looked at and I was like, right, we can achieve something here. Cause, uh, four or five years ago, I moved up to Brisbane and started coaching at a, a little state school pool called uh, Somerset Hills. And yeah. much the same as you, I walked in, I was like, hang on a second. What is this? Cause nobody prepares you for what a, a Brisbane state school pool uh, yeah. actually looks like. Um, and it's, as you said, it's six little skinny lanes. They're not even actual sizes and you can really only put one person in it uh, at a time. And, um, you know, the, the shallow end is 0 0.8. Anyway, I digress. We um, yeah. walked in there and, and I looked at what you guys were achieving and I thought, well, it's definitely, you know, we can get something out of this if we have the right mindset and we have a look at how we're doing things and think a little bit differently and yeah. um, certainly have a positive mindset, which obviously you guys did. So I want to give you some props there, mate. You definitely, you wouldn't oh, have well, known it, you. but you definitely, uh, I was yeah. looking from afar going, right, if, if they can do it, we can definitely do it. That's it. No, I think everyone, you know, when you look at a pool, hey, you've got a pool. Anything's achievable, achievable, and you can get in there. And if you set your goals right, you know, you can start ticking those off. And this game's not a short game; it's a long game. And you know, being in front of the long haul, don't try and think it's going to be a short game. Your legacy as a as a swimmer in the sport, you know, if people mention your name. How would you like to be remembered as an athlete? Um, look, I look at it. I pride myself and I was always a hard worker um, and always did the little things to you know, better myself, but also hopefully inspire the person next to me to do the little things to be better as well.
mate. Perfect. Uh, firstly, mate, I want to thank you very much for coming on the podcast. As I said, I know you're a busy man and you've got uh, coaching and all that other stuff going on. So I appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Appreciate uh, it. It's been an honour to, to go through your career with you. You're a champion in and out of the pool. And thank you to your contribution to, you know, swimming here in Australia. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for coming on Off The Block Swing Podcast. Too easy. Thanks for having me, mate. No worries. Today's episode of Off The Block Swimming Podcast is proudly brought to you by Pro Swim Workouts.